Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our very special um, webinar tonight dedicated to uh, the Ukrainian Film Festival. My name is Olesa Khromovichuk and I am the director of the Ukrainian Institute London. Uh, we are a center for educational and cultural activities dedicated to Ukraine and we are a registered charity, so we're entirely funded through our events and donations and we're extremely grateful to all of you who purchased your tickets for tonight's webinar because it allows us to run at least some of our uh, webinars free of charge. The aim of the Institute is to broaden knowledge about Ukraine in the UK and beyond. And in the next couple of weeks, we have a wonderful opportunity to do so through Ukrainian cinema. Together with Cambridge Ukrainian Studies, we organize the Film Festival of Ukrainian Films, which will run until the 1st of December. One of the four films that we selected, The Forgotten, um, is at the heart of tonight's webinar. We are extremely lucky to have the director of the film, Daria Onishchenko, join us today um, for this live discussion uh, from Munich. So let me now introduce our moderator, Vitaly Chernetsky is Associate Professor in Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of Kansas. Um, he is a past president of the American Association for Ukrainian Studies, and he held this post between 2009 and 2018. Um, and he is the current vice president and scholarly secretary of the Shevchenko Scientific Society in the US. Uh, Vitaly's research interests include Ukrainian literature and culture, including film, theater, visual art, as well as East and Central European and Central Asian literatures and culture. And Vitaly is a native of Odessa. So Vitaly, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be here. And big thanks uh, to uh, Ukraine Institute London for inviting me to uh, be uh, the moderator of uh, today's event. Uh, it is wonderful that uh, this festival is happening as a result of the collaborative efforts of uh, Ukrainian Institute London and Cambridge Ukrainian Studies, and that we have a chance to watch these excellent uh, recent Ukrainian films and have meetings with the creative folk behind them. Uh, today, I'm especially pleased uh, to welcome here the director of The Forgotten, Zabuti, the uh, first film showcase at the festival. Her name is Daria Nishchenko. Uh, she's a native of Kyiv and she has received her uh, first university degree in Kyiv as a journalist. But after that, she continued her studies in uh, Munich, uh, Germany at uh, the Academy of Film and Television. And she has been active uh, as a filmmaker, as a film director, and also as an author or co-author of scripts for her own films now for well over a decade. After uh, making several short films that were warmly received at international festivals, she uh, debuted with uh, the full uh, length feature film called Nostalgia um, six years ago. And that film was a co production with uh, Germany and Serbia. Uh, the film we are discussing today is a co production with Switzerland. So uh, this is wonderful that Ukrainian cinema can partner with other countries in bringing these important creative projects to the audience. Uh, the uh, film we're discussing today was featured in the work of progress in progress pitching session at the Odessa International Film Festival. It had its world premiere at the Warsaw International Film Festival in the fall of last year. And it was showcased this year at the Movadist International Film Festival in Kyiv as a film with Kretya, a, fil a discovery that the festival spotlights. And it also participated in competition at the Avanka Film Festival in Portugal, where it won several prizes. So uh, my first question would actually uh, for you, Daria, will have to do with the practice of co-production. This film is co-produced with uh, Switzerland. How did this come to be? And 
what was the role of the Swiss partners? What did their involvement make possible that would not have been possible otherwise for you as a filmmaker? Uh, good evening, Vitaly. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone who is there because for us filmmakers in these difficult times of pandemic, it's really hard times for all people. We are used to communicate live, not uh, through internet, uh, but uh, still uh, the Zoom gives us new possibilities. Um, back to your question, uh, this uh, co-production with Switzerland uh, was the first uh, co-production with Switzerland uh, for Ukraine. Uh, Switzerland is a very small country, as we know, and actually uh, pol politically very uh, no neutral, neutral. Uh, so they normally don't like to interrupt in some um, military conflicts and so on. That's why many people ask me why they like the idea of your movie, because it tells about the conflict, uh, military conflict and so on. Um, I think um, if we're looking for co-production, in my experience, as director, I'm always um, building this uh, co-production structure by myself meaning i'm looking for co-producers from different countries and take them on the hands and bring them together somehow it, it doesn't work differently for me that producers look themselves and in this case um i just saw that this topic of um of refugees of people who have to escape from other regions is this basic message that can be interesting also for co-producers um, outside of Ukraine, uh, because uh, unfortunately the events in Ukraine, our war situation is already out of the uh, latest news and um, it was really hard to finance this movie in Germany, for instance, uh, German uh, production companies, but also TV uh, stations told me that uh, it's it kind of uh, first they told me when uh, there, there was Maidan revolution and uh, the war started they told me that it's too early because you cannot uh, depict war without too many uh, feelings now what do you have and it won't be objective so you have to wait when i waited a little bit they told me that and now it's too late because it's out of the news so with germany it was difficult and um, then i tried switzerland and i was really surprised and um, they jumped on board and um, they became our partners in the sense that they financed um, uh, post-production they we did editing in switzerland we did uh, comp we were composing music in uh, switzerland and they did some other organization stuff uh, thank you so much. Speaking of music, you have a very interesting soundtrack in this film. You incorporate uh, a song by uh, the wonderful uh, diasporic Ukrainian singer from the US, Kvitka Tsisik. You have a song by Odin Fkanoe uh, and other contemporary Ukrainian bands. What? How did those choices get made? Why was it important, for instance, to have a Kvit Katsisik song at the opening credits, which I think is a very powerful statement setting the tone of the film? Um, I, I even don't remember now how I came exactly on this song, but I, when I was, I just somehow from the very first side when we tried this song, I knew that it really suits uh, to this opening. Um, of course, I like uh, the songs of Kvitka, and um, we um, also tried to use both uh, modern uh, music, so we have some tracks of the modern bands, but also to use some original um, songs, folk songs, and original sounds. So the composer from Switzerland, uh, he got a task to use uh, as little uh, music actually as possible. Um, but to use original instruments. And um, I think he did it good. Some, in some parts, it uh, looks like kind of uh, shaman, esoteric music. Uh, but uh, my idea was to underline the emotions of the characters so that the mu music doesn't take too much attention on itself. Thank you. Uh, another question which probably many people may have uh, when we hear about uh, the uh, war uh, in Donbass, more often than not, uh, the first city that comes to uh, people's mind is Donetsk. You, however, decided to set this film in Luhansk. Uh, could you please uh, tell us why did you make that decision? Why setting it in Luhansk was important for you? 
we have two occupied regions. It's Donetsk, uh, so-called by uh, separatists, Donetsk Republic and uh, Lugansk Republic, as they call it. And we have an ex-Crimea. In this story, we gathered uh, the, the stories, the impressions of the people um, who stay in all those three occupied and next territories. And uh, this place in our movie is a kind of collective place because for instance, uh, this uh, fabric isolation where the events take place with the sculptures, it really existed in uh, Donetsk. So we moved them in the film to Lugansk. Uh, we have, uh, for instance, the story of the teacher, which was a kind of similar, which we found information about uh, happened in Crimea. We did research with uh, lots of people from East occupied regions, and we did a, a story based on all those um, stories together uh, and put it uh, to Lugansk. So it's kind of collective uh, meaning. All right. Uh, speaking of the teachers, then this also something that I uh, thought about in that probably one of the best known now uh, works of literature about this conflict, uh, Sergei Jadan's uh, novel Internat, The Orphanage. Uh, the main protagonist is also a Ukrainian language uh, secondary school teacher. Why did you feel it was important to give the female protagonist in your film this profession? I think that the teachers, uh, I, I was really moved by the stories I heard from the people when gathering information about this. I was in 2017 in the east um, of Ukraine in accompanying German uh, journalist groups. And I had an opportunity to uh, speak with people uh, who escaped from the regions, uh, whose relatives are still there and um, the stories of the teachers who had to do this uh, qualification to change actually uh, what I was shocked about it was uh, that the length the, it's a kind of discrimination we can't imagine now um, for instance me like living many years between Germany and Ukraine I can't imagine that someone will forbid me to speak my native language and I think this native uh, language, uh, Ukrainian language topic uh, is very important personally for me because I grew up in the um, a Russian speaking family and only during Maidan actually I changed uh, to Ukrainian in my um, uh, daily life. I still speak not perfectly, but I'm uh, trying to do my best learning it more and more. And um, even though I was studying Ukrainian in university in Kyiv and so on, but still I came from Russian speaking family and only uh, during Maidan, I realized that even in my family, there was a kind of discriminating attitude to Ukrainian. Uh, my grandmother, for instance, was talking about Ukrainian like a kind of um, village uh, language, making jokes about it. And um, if someone in the uh, in school was speaking Ukrainian in Kyiv, in the middle of Kyiv, uh, the other children could uh, also make stupid jokes about them. And this problem is very deep in our society. So for me, it was important to speak openly about it in, and to show what uh, actually the centuries, not only this conflict, but the centuries of Russification of trying to destroy Ukrainian language did with our country. Absolutely, thank you. And yes, there's a very, powerful scene of the birthday party for those who haven't seen the film where uh, the teacher gets actually mocked uh, derisively for the language that she speaks and that she teaches. Um, moving to another... Just I'm sorry Vitaly I have to tell this because I was yes. kind of shocked I came yeah. lately to Kiev, I think two months ago, also to the place where my parents live uh, near Kiev and summer house. And there were some guests uh, coming and I was maybe the only person speaking um, Ukrainian among them. And, and some woman told me like, why do you speak Ukrainian? I don't understand. And I was like, what? I'm, I'm in Kiev, I'm in Ukraine and I get this question. And at the same time, the Russians in Ukraine always say that we forbid them to speak Ukrainian. So this kind of, this is a problem, big problem of our uh, society. And I really don't know the cases when someone in Ukraine forbids to speak Russian, but the opposite uh, kind of discrimination I see all the time. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes, this is unfortunately is a 
uh, factor that the challenge that we have to continue facing in everyday experiences, uh, for instance, uh, getting served uh, in a restaurant or in another store in the in Ukrainian and things of that kind. This remains a persistent problem. Um, Switching gears a little bit, uh, your film includes a memorable episode based, uh, and you already brought this up, on the real event that happened when uh, the separatists took control of the Isolatia cultural space in Donetsk. Uh, this was a former factory uh, for uh, producing electrical isolation materials, and it became a great center for innovative art. And unfortunately, uh, when it was captured uh, by the by Russia and, and the separatists, it became basically a site of torture, site of war crimes, and also a lot of works of art were destroyed. So you got in touch with the artist Maria Kulikovska, uh, whose work was exhibited there and who, which was destroyed by the separatists. Why did you? Um, feel this was very important. What do you think having her and her performance with her own art, what does it add to the film that you think is really important? It was definitely an artistic experiment, but it happened uh, by chance that I met uh, Maria in Munich uh, while she had her exhibition there. And I saw her sculptures before I knew the story of those sculptures. I was somehow moved uh, by them. I asked her if we could think about using this culture somehow in the movie. And then she told me this really story that suited so much in the context of our film, uh, uh, how separatists destroyed them. And also the, um, there were people killed at that uh, fabric, uh, mm -hmm. not the sculptures is the most important, but uh, that they were destroyed, but the people were killed there. Uh, Maria, uh, for Marie, it was very, very difficult moment in her life because she uh, comes herself from K uh, Crimea, uh, her family. Uh, since that time she was put on the list of the forbidden artists in Russia, so she uh, can't uh, until now visit her family in Crimea. Uh, she's a quite well known now sculptor, uh, sculptor around Europe. She did her exhibitions also in London um, art ga uh, gallery of modern arts and um, she does lots of provocative art performances but in all her latest work she speaks about the annexation of her uh, native um, Crimea and um, this story that happened in isolation for me it's a symbol like every totalitarian system destroys art as a symbol of freedom um, if it's uh, ES um, Islamism, or if it's uh, separ uh, pro Russian separatists in East Europe, but I think art is a kind of symbol that the free people will follow to fight for their ideals. Uh, that's why it's, I think it's a strong uh, message uh, for, for the movie, metaphor. Thank you so much. Uh, I got just got a reminder from our hosts that we haven't uh, played the trailer of the film for our audience yet. So I will share my screen now and we will see the trailer of the film. No. Одним из самых главных праздников для нас является 23 февраля. Во всех школах будут проводиться мероприятия, и поэтому вы тоже должны будете включить в программу ваших уроков подготовку к Дню Советской Армии. Просто не хочется, чтобы она здесь забыли. Вот такое ощущение, будто бы всем похер. Я когда езжу на Украину за бабушкой на пенсии, нас там все тупо ненавидят, за предателей считают. Это ненормально. Ну а то, что он не совершенно ритмий, разве можно его просто так забрать? Ну, мы оформили. Теперь мы сможем поехать. На четвертом блокпосту договорено. После четырех можете ехать. Едет он. Эй, Барт, что происходит? Да прям зараз, но 
уже совсем скоро. И сказали, что твоя училка вчера освободила одного укропа. А он развешивал флажки по городу. Ты придурок? Дай ему убить! сука! Мы здесь никого не принуждаем. Когда же это закончится все? Когда? Все это закончится. Yes, some very powerful uh, scenes that we see there and uh, I, again, am really grateful that we have the opportunity uh, to see the film here and at the festival and uh, that it helps us think and uh, feel about it and uh, try to process it. Uh, one other question that I had, uh, as I was watching the film, I noted that the film takes place in winter and the color palette is very gray and washed out. I mean, there are a few sort of bright elements of color, but they are very few generally. Was this a deliberate decision for you? I'm thinking of another international co-production about the war in Donbass, the uh, Lithuanian-Ukrainian-French film uh, Frost by Sharunas Bartas that also is set in wintertime. Um, this may be a coincidence, but to me it's interesting that why winter is being chosen as the time when events take place. Um, normally, I would, I, at the beginning I was, I preferred to shoot in autumn, but uh, because of financing reasons we moved to winter i think uh, it's possible to tell such story actually in any time of the year but uh, uh, winter brings uh, some uh, some advantages uh, with this also disadvantages because the shooting in winter building the checkpoints and lots of other organizations for the shooting was quite hard it was really very cold winter with lots of snow which is also not usually in uh, ukraine nowadays but it was a tough winter and uh, what, uh, what I have to say here is that I work on all my films with the Bosnian um, DOP, Erol Zubcevic, he comes from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, he likes to work in very realistic um, kind of aesthetic. Uh, he's using as little uh, light equipment as possible to create this kind of cold and realistic uh, light, which I personally um, appreciate a lot in his work. And, uh, that's why uh, it was a kind of also visual concept to achieve this um, uh, impression. You actually anticipated my next question because I was going to ask precisely about this. You're working with the cinematographer Erol Zubcevic, who is Bosnian. And um, so with that, uh, I mean, you've just described some elements of his personal aesthetics. I was also thinking of the tradition, both the Yugoslav and post-Yugoslav cinematic tradition and the experiences, of course, of the war in Bosnia. Um, and I wonder how he felt about that. Did uh, shooting this film but the war in Ukraine bring for him childhood memories. I don't know if he was in Sarajevo during the siege or not. Uh, probably maybe he was a refugee. I don't know any of those details, but I would imagine that this would personally, you know, be very intense for him. Uh, it was, it, it really was. Uh, he told me, Daria, not one more war, please. <laughs> after, after the shooting of this movie, he said, I'm really tired from, uh, from wars. Uh, but this is also important topic for him, uh, uh, war, um, refugees. Uh, he's dealing with this topic on many films in ex-Yugoslavia. It was mm -hmm. like a kind of wave also in the European film um, 
film markets and the film festivals uh, that after the war in Yugoslavia, the, the many great films from uh, that region um, appeared. Unfortunately, uh, that's true that the wars and revolution also brought uh, this appearance of the new wave of the Ukrainian um, cinema. And I think it's uh, logically because after the war, after revolution, the creative people, they have this need to express their uh, feelings, their emotions, their ideas about this situation. Um, Errol uh, came through uh, this war in Yugoslavia, was also injured during it, so uh, he really understood the importance um, of what we are doing, but also many other people on set who were working with us. Uh, we had people who have been also already in the east of Ukraine fighting or participating as volunteers, and I had this uh, feeling that the team supports me a lot because they believe in the movie, because believe in the importance to, to spread these messages with the film, even though um, messages is maybe too dangerous word. I really don't want that this film will be put in the kind of too patriotic or too propaganda from the Ukrainian side. For me, it was important to show uh, both sides of the medals. And um, I hope that this movie is realistic enough not to get in this um, role. The uh, uh, female leads uh, in the film, uh, the actress uh, Marina uh, Koshkina, she herself is from the Luhansk region. And I looked up her filmography. Uh, her other recent films are quite different. They set in Western Ukraine and they're historical films. She played uh, both in Vidana, uh, the uh, film adaptation of uh, Sofia Andruhovich's novel Felix Savstria, and in uh, the new remake of Zahar Berkut, The Rising Hawk in the English uh, language international release. So uh, yes, uh, this is very the big departure from those two films. How was this experience for her, and what was her being from that region? What was the ad additional value that you think that it brought to the film? I didn't know she comes from Luhansk when I casted her. She came to casting, and uh, actually, she didn't get the role first because uh, we imagined completely different actress. We looked for someone with. Uh, brown uh, hair was more not so thin she was too young she was 26 and so on but it was difficult to find an actress somehow i wasn't satisfied with anyone and 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 then marie marina she was really she was very authentic she had something like uh, the characters of lars von triers have this kind of inside of her this um a ner nervous uh, nervous um, hesitation or I don't know emotions inside of her that you can feel and she was really uh, fighting for the role she wanted to play so much uh, so I was really impressed with uh, her cast and uh, we invited her a second time and then I was quite sure that we should take her um, only after that I found out that she comes from Lugansk for the movie it was um, um, an uh, advantage because she's speaking uh, an original uh, um, accent of that region uh, so it brought us also a kind of advantage from this part and um, her part of the family is uh, living in the Luhansk region uh, for her it was also a um, uh, first role I think uh, in such kind of uh, social realistic mm -hmm. drama and I think she did really a good job. Absolutely, I would definitely agree with that. By now we have already accumulated several uh, thoughtful and interesting questions from the audience members. So I, uh, while I have more questions, uh, I think we should let the uh, audience members uh, give, give them a chance to ask. And I think our first uh, uh, audience member who will be asking a question is William Blacker. And uh, William, would you like to ask your question, please? Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Vitali and Daria, for such an interesting uh, discussion. And I really enjoyed the film. I thought it was extremely powerful. Um, and I'm really glad that it's, it's been shown on this platform. Um, I wanted to return to something that was kind of discussed already at the beginning of the discussion, but maybe to ask you to speak more about it. And it was how you 
collected the stories that that formed the basis of the film? Uh, what was the kind of process that was involved? Where did you go? Where did you find the people? Um, and I was also interested, uh, I mean, was it difficult to get them to talk about their experiences? Uh, I imagine, you know, it probably was. And also, what has your, uh, what has the reaction of people who lived through the occupation from that region been to watching the film? I'd be very interested to hear about that. So, uh, thanks for your question. Um, we gathered, it was a long time how we gathered the information. Um, as I told already, I've been accompanying German uh, documentary television groups uh, to east of Ukraine a few times. Um, I did also a documentary film for Swiss television about um, re refugees from the east of uh, Ukraine. Uh, we got lots of inter information from the internet press. Uh, also, people from the occupied regions wrote to me, but of course, they are more scared to, to tell their names, to tell what the real things about. Um, so, but at the end, we had enough information and more than enough, I would say. Uh, the reaction um, of the people um, for me was very important, how the people from those regions will react to the movie. Uh, we showed it already in Kharkiv, uh, unfortunately online because of pandemic. Um, uh, in Kyiv we had already cinema release um, in the end of the summer and also premiere at the Film Festival Moldy, so people could see it on the, on the big screen. I must say that I'm really satisfied uh, by now with the reactions. Um, of course, cinema is something where everyone is free to tell their opinions and so on. Uh, I'm, I must say the, the tough boys like uh, soldiers who has been really like fighting there and the most critique always comes from them because they always try to look some very re realistic details and if it's something not completely 100% realistic they say no 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 this uh, this is not in, in, in the front in the war it's different um, but that's okay I think and uh, from the feelings, from the emotional part, uh, what, uh, what is people come uh, through, uh, who move from those regions, who stay in those regions, I um, got the feeling that we really told a truthful and realistic story. Uh, wonderful, uh, thank you. Our yeah. next question uh, comes from a Ukrainian-American filmmaker, so a colleague of yours, uh, Damien Kolodi, and uh, Damien, the floor is yours. Hi. Hi, Daria. Hi, Vitaly. Hi. <laughs> um, I, I watched the film last night and I, I really enjoyed it. You always sort of um, wonder what is life like in these regions. And it felt the, the film felt very realistic in portraying, you know, that there's these people that are stuck there and everyone's trying to make the best of this awful scenario. And, and my question was, like, at times, it really felt almost like a documentary. And I was wondering uh, how many people were, were professional actors versus um, maybe people that were just cast because they had some authenticity um, to the story or to the location. And, and where was it filmed? Because it also felt like it, we were really there. And I'm assuming probably you didn't film in the LNR? Um, the, the, we worked with professional um, actors mostly. There were some people casted who are not professional actors, but uh, all main leads are done by, uh, by real actors because it's always a risky thing. Um, I, I prefer to work with professional people, but um, I'm always trying to work with this um, realistic uh, style and uh, for me it's important to give the actors lots of space uh, to give them opportunity to improvise uh, we never do storyboard with uh, my dop so we just come on set and do blocking before we uh, start shooting and he actually follows with his uh, uh, camera the uh, actors this gives us kind of a realistic impression i think for the camera itself and uh, this uh, gives the actors opportunity to to do whatever they want. Let's call it like this. So we just have to agree that we move in the right direction and together we create something um, already on set during the shooting. That's um, how I work normally. Um, as for shooting locations, we were shooting in um, Kiev and the suburbs of Kiev and the small cities uh, 
in uh, Kyiv region, but we also went to the east of Ukraine to the city of Slavyansk and uh, uh, suburbs of Slavyansk. Um, there we had a big uh, weather problem because uh, Kyiv was full of snow, very cold, and when we arrived to Slavyansk, it's like one night with a train, and uh, we go out and we see the green grass and sun shining <laughs> and i understand that i will never never be able to cut all this together so the, the, the part of the material from uh, the east unfortunately was not um, comparable not uh, possible to edit with the rest but uh, we got enough still thank you so much we have uh, our next question from irena kuznetsova Please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm a social geographer from the University of Birmingham. And first of all, I just would like to, to thank you for documenting experiences of uh, people from occupied territories and displaced people, because in our interviews, we have, we have seen the exactly same uh, cases as you described in, in, in your movie about, for example, number plates, you know, of against people in uh, uh, Kiev and so on. But I would like to ask a different question. Um, uh, I was uh, uh, struck by the uh, start of the movie and about how Maria Pukulikovska shooting kill sculptures and the theme of uh, sexual violence and, uh, you know, and female body and this uh, embodiment of war um, in your movie, I think is very important. So I just wonder how did you come to the theme and then how you feel about it? Um, I think this uh, movie really tells the story of quite a tough woman who is uh, staying alone um, actually in the world where everyone around her has different opinions. So she's a person for me with strong uh, um, moral principles who, stay, uh, who stays true to herself first of all. And uh, this kind of violence around wherever she goes, either it's her husband or it's uh, uh, people in school, who, how they talk to her, or the policeman guys who nearly rape her, it's, uh, it's violence everywhere. And she is uh, somehow still staying strong and uh, remains uh, true to what she believes in. Uh, Maria's uh, sculptures and Maria's works uh, for me, um, correspond very good with this message because Maria is a very feministic um, sculptor. Her works are always very feministic. I am less, I must say, normally when I write the scripts, uh, European producers uh, tell me that my um, women characters are too weak, that they have to be more stronger and dominating for the uh, modern European markets. But unfortunately, um, of course, I understand that the situation in all occupied regions of the world is especially uh, difficult for women because they uh, become even more uh, victims of violence in the occupied regions, wherever it is, not only in Ukraine. Uh, so this was an important part of our story from the very beginning. And I'm, I'm actually glad that it comes through, that, many, that I get lots of feedback uh, on it. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, our next uh, question comes from Yuri Bender. Uh, if you could please ask your question now. Yes, hello, Vitali. Hello, Daria. Thank you very much for your wonderful film, for sharing this with, with us. I was, I was watching it just before the Q&A session started tonight, and many interesting incidents in it and um, which were very realistic and um, even before 2014 I saw many of these things happening in in Donbass in Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast which were um, portrayed so evocatively in your film and um, the education system in particular is, is something I'm, I'm interested in because even in the days of President Yushchenko I visited schools in Luhansk Oblast and the curriculum then was quite similar to the one under the LNR now which you're which you're showing in your film that um, linguistically and culturally it was very I wouldn't even say Russian it was very Soviet rather than than Ukrainian and it was the um, the, the Prasniki, the festivals, the, the holidays being 
celebrated were all the the Soviet ones, and the um, all of the teaching was around those those festivals, and it was all dating back to Soviet days. Yet I didn't hear anybody in those times calling themselves, identifying themselves Ukrainians in Donbas, identifying themselves as Russians or loyal to Russia. So, and also in your film, you show many players, characters who, who are going along with the system because it's easier for them. So what I wanted to ask you, how deep do you feel the sense of identity actually exists in um, in Luhansk Oblast to LNR to Russia, and if it's perhaps more fluid, do you feel there's still some hope for this identity eventually swinging back towards Ukraine? Thanks, Yuri, for your question. It's uh, not an easy question because um, if you look historically on those regions, you probably know that they were assimilated for centuries with uh, people from uh, Russia, first of all. So already for um, long times before, uh, from the uh, creation of the Soviet Union, especially 20s, 30s years, 50s, um, lots of Russian people moved there and Ukraines had to move out and so on. Uh, we don't have also to forget the tragedy of Holodomor, which was taking place not only in Kiev, Zhitomir, but in the whole region. Uh, so we, we lost a big part of uh, demographic uh, original um, people there. And uh, this is one part of the problem. Uh, the second problem that uh, sure, the close neighborhood to Russia makes uh, Russian propaganda more easy to spread their ideas in that region, to spread the informatic, uh, information policy, um, to do information attacks even now and so on. I think that uh, when the war started, when um, we saw another citizen in the East, like Kharkiv, for instance, who took a very strong pro-Ukrainian position from the very beginning, um, Lugansk and uh, Donetsk didn't have this opportunity because the um, the Russian army moved there quite uh, fast. I think that uh, most of the people who wanted to leave to Russia in this situation to escape war, they already moved. Most of the people who wanted to move to Ukraine that also already moved. But um, as in any uh, war, there are people who can't go because they have their sick uh, parents, uh, grandparents, they don't want to leave maybe their flat, they've been earning money for their whole life or their business that they have building or just don't uh, know where to go like Yuri, Yuri and Marina um, in my, in Nina and my films, they just understand that no one needs them in Ukraine. So there are people who stay. And um, I think, unfortunately, it's uh, true that many people just want the war to be finished, but don't really care um, what, is, what it's all about. So the people who really have this um, sense of what it's going about, um, they are in the minority. But I think, and this was my idea in this movie, to say that these people give us the hope that one day we can return these territories. If we will lose these people, we'll lose also these territories forever. So Ukraine is a state, Ukraine is a government, has to do everything to support not only displaced people, but only the, also the people who stay there, who still believe in Ukraine, who still believe in the possibility to be reunited again as one country. And uh, it's our responsibility, actually, not only on the government, we, can, we can't always put all the responsibilities on the government, which doesn't function anyway, <laughs> but it's the responsibility of us Ukrainians to also not to forget about these people. That's also the uh, why this title of the movie is the forgotten. I think there's a lot of optimism in what you say, Daria, despite and that optimism is in your film amongst the, the bleakness as well. Thanks, I hope. We have a small factual question uh, from someone who, like myself, is here in the US, so could not see uh, the film in person. This is uh, uh, Mrs. Vera Kaczmarski, and she was asking, which song by Kvitka did you use in the film? Bandura. Vzav Bandura. Vzav Bandura, tak. Yes, uh, beautiful, beautiful song. 
Our uh, next uh, live question comes from Anna Reed. Uh, if you could please ask your question now. Hi, Dev. Um, thank you very much uh, for coming on. And I'm absolutely blown away by your film. Many, many congratulations. Um, I was in La Hanse in 2014 and 2015 reporting, and it brought it all back. I thought I thought you sort of built up layer upon layer of um, little detail, which often you just glanced at, um, which really built up a sort of rich, convincing, um, you know, atmospheric picture. And you sort of touched touched on lots of little things. Um, you know, you managed to show not tell to make all sorts of points. That's a very sort of I, I felt a very sort of subtle. Um, way uh, it was a wonderful film um my my question was my first question was about Slaviansk. i i thought you i mean when i saw those uh, bombed buildings i um the shell buildings i thought you must have pro probably had filmed there um i mean a few years ago it was still very much a half pro kiev half pro moscow town you know people going around um painting yellow and blue stripes on the curbs and then other people going around painting over them again um, did you encounter any hostility while you were there? That was my first question. The second one was, um, you sort of hold a, I thought you hold a wonderful, you held a wonderfully sort of humane, slightly distanced, um, you know, sort of apolitical line throughout the film. It was concentrating on individuals and their di dilemmas. Um, how hard was that to do? Um, for you personally, and how much sort of social and um, you know professional pressure did you come under? Did you did you feel any pressure to make it more um, a more overtly political film? Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, in Slavyansk, I actually didn't uh, feel any kind of um, I didn't experience any kind of problems when we were shooting there. We had. Uh, our location manager uh, from there who was uh, helping us a lot but it was a kind of a really team moving uh, here and there for the concrete shooting so we didn't have uh, during the shooting itself we didn't have opportunity to speak to much with the people there uh, when i've been there before uh, years ah. before i had uh, the same impression as you that it's half half 50 50 and probably it's like this because uh, lots of people who have different position let's say pro-russian position but just don't want to stay in this occupied region they moved also to slavansk and live there now so we have uh, people from the both uh, parts or both uh, presenting both opinions uh, living uh, in slavansk until nowadays and um, uh, but still, um, I'm glad that the city returned back under Ukrainian control. And there are also lots of uh, now um, homeless um, um, children who stayed without parents after war who live now in Slavansk and uh, our volunteers taking care of them. It became a kind of base for you know, children who lost uh, their families in, in, in war. Um, as for uh, showing the political topic, how hard it was for me, it was hard because of course, and uh, as most Ukrainians, I am very patriotic and uh, I would like to say it maybe in, in a more patriotic way, but I understood the responsibility as director uh, who wants to show the film also to the international audience, but also as a journalist with my first education that I have to be object objective. And it's not my um, it's not my job. It's not my task to show my political opinions. My task is to show the story of the people and to explain their emotions, their feelings, to tell the stories that will uh, present uh, both sides, both views, to show the concrete situations and not to to send my political messages in the world. I, I really uh, tried to avoid this, and um, it was hard for me. Uh, my question would be my next question would be about uh, the conditions uh, in which uh, the film uh, was made uh, the shooting happened under the previous uh, Ukrainian presidential administration and we know of course that after the revolution of dignity and then the Russian aggression uh, Ukraine really mobilized a lot of its cultural resources and this uh, for the first time in its history after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Ukrainian film industry finally had very serious state support. Things 
have become more complicated, more precarious since then under uh, the current administration of President Zelensky. Um, as an active filmmaker who uh, is in fact pursuing a new project, um, how do you feel in terms of uh, the challenges and the opportunities uh, for filmmakers who try to launch new projects now? Has it become significantly more difficult? Um, are you still optimistic about being able to pursue and succeed with new projects in the current conditions? Um, I'm dealing quite a lot with this. I'm also a member of Ukrainian uh, Film Academy and um, I have been uh, shooting this film um, with Parashenka regime, let's say it. And um, uh, before uh, my uh, debut film is Istalgia, I did uh, with Yanukovych. It was last year before uh, Maidan uh, revolution. So um, I can compare a lot what happened after Maidan because before that we had a kind of transformations in the film funding system but still it was based completely on very old soviet um, uh, laws and uh, it was very very corrupted so if you got 200,000 from the film fund you just had to get to give something like 20 percent cuts uh, in the back or whatever it was corruption everywhere and um, the, the development of the film business what was really not so good. Uh, the money, uh, the TV stations, some corrupt that belong to some oligarchs got the money at the end and stuff like this. After Maidan, the situation really got better, not completely, but maybe something like 60%. And we finally got a kind of renaissance of our Ukrainian cinema because in the years of the Maidan, we really see now big successes of our filmmakers both in feature films but also in documentary it's for me it's like documentary even i want to make an ex, um, ex emphasize on documentary um, because i'm really impressed the people in ukraine started to go to the cinemas to watch documentary movies this was uh, for me before i saw it only in switzerland like even in germany it's not so popular but there were so suddenly after my dance so many um high and hot topics in the society that uh, I think the artists just picked it, all this and we really had um, a cool atmosphere as uh, the ex-head of uh, film uh, fund uh, Pilip Ilyenko. Uh, he did uh, really a lot for this. Uh, he moved a lot in the uh, development of uh, co-productions. Uh, Ukraine was presented now on all biggest co-production markets and so on and so on. And then Zelensky came and uh, now I'm also developing two uh, new projects with uh, this new film uh, fund people and so on. Um, it's still not clear the situation at the moment. I mean, we had last pitchings uh, in the film fund, which were, uh, we, which we had before. I, I can't say that something now changed for wars, but it's still a uh, lots of, um, uh, lots of conflicts inside of the film fund, inside of the um, commissions. I'm uh, criticizing a lot uh, the system, how our pitchings are done, who gets money at the end. Uh, there are many top uh, things to criticize there still. Um, but I think we have lots of new talents and that's the most important thing. We have young people who want to learn, who want to do something. The biggest problem is education, of course, because our film school in Kiev doesn't get any um, governmental support until now. So like for um, comparison in Munich Film Academy, where I've been studying, you shoot your first uh, uh, short movie with 16 millimeter um, film material uh, at the end of the first year of your studies. And in Ukraine, you never get this opportunity until your diploma. Maybe as diploma, you can shoot a short film, where in Europe, you shoot a feature film at the end of your studies. So our students don't get this money, but who gets this money? The big production companies who um, get uh, the money for uh, short films, even though they did already lots of uh, co-production, successful films, and so on and so on. So this uh, system has lots of uh, still things we should work at. Thank you so much. Our next uh, question from the audience comes from Lesa. Please forgive me if I'm uh, mispronouncing your last name, Scully. Hello, yes, hi. Can you see us? 
Yes. yes. I... Uh, thank you so much for the film. My daughter and I, Sophia and um, Lesia, we watched it last night and we were just bowled over. It was just amazing. Um, I'm an ex-reporter, so obviously for me, what caught my eye was the uh, the reporter character on the ground who kept staging these fake uh, fake scenarios. And I just wondered how you had come up with that idea and whether you intended that to be sort of the light relief or the pathos of the movie being a little bit of a, a yeah, a bit of a, a moment that we could all just look into the the reality the absurdity of it and uh yeah just corresponding with the fake news that we always have problems with now thank you uh, thank you Lisa. um by the way i don't know if everyone recognized because normally not everyone does uh, maria kulikovska the sculptor she's playing the, the journalist girl and um it was also our discussion with her she was the first um it was her first debut in cinema she never uh, played uh, before and uh, she told me, I really want to play this role because I want to play the person I really hate. <laughs> I want <laughs> to present someone I really hate myself. It's like my enemy. So, and uh, this uh, journalist, actually also most of the stories are based on the things we found during our researches, like the scene with the, with the shooting in the uh, behind where you see then the light goes down and the journalist is just in a small flat pretending that they are being under a third. Uh, this, uh, even on internet and YouTube, you can find these videos how the uh, Russian television uh, makes such films. Uh, so uh, the same uh, story with the minibus and explosion. Um, with uh, statists with extras who they uh, pay to run around and scream and so on. And this is an important element of this hybrid war, um, of every modern war, unfortunately, uh, especially easy to realize and such uh, to, to, to make uh, it uh, take place in such occupied areas. Uh, so I think it was important to, to show it. Okay. Um, a small technical question uh, comes from uh, Damien Kovodi. Uh, what are the future screening and distribution plans for the film, both in Ukraine and internationally? This uh, pandemic situation and just uh, catastrophe for the whole uh, film business. It's, uh, uh, we were lucky that we had a premiere at the Warsaw Film uh, Festival uh, before the corona pandemic started. And after that, it started and lots of festivals were canceled or went online. Uh, we, had, we had to have uh, distribution cinema release in uh, Switzerland. It was postponed because of Corona, cinemas were closed. Uh, so until now we were lucky to, uh, with our Ukrainian release that we managed to go in the cinemas. Of course, during Corona was also not so easy, much less people as usually. And um, in Ukraine, we run already on the VOD platform. You can watch the movie there um, if you are in Ukraine. Uh, we have already a film on the VOD platform in Switzerland. Uh, in some other countries, I'm now not sure where we are at the moment. We've been showing the film already at the festivals in Austria, in the, um, Portugal, in Spain, in Italy, in uh, France, in uh, Germany. We had premiere in September in Germany, in Munich. So uh, we're traveling through festivals, but uh, it's just nothing to compare with normal with normal situation without coronavirus. Uh, the only thing uh, we're not alone there, all filmmakers now go through this uh, crisis and um, we hope one day it will be over. Um, thank you. Our next question, uh, another question from Anna Reed, which is also a question that I wanted to ask myself. And that is, you mentioned uh, new projects that are now in, pi in the pipeline. And I was especially excited to learn that one of them is about Malevich. Uh, could you perhaps tell us a little bit as about these uh, projects that you're now working on? Yes, this is my new baby, Malevich. Uh, I'm really, um, I'm really crazy about this project because Malevich is one of my uh, very favorite painters, and it was my uh, dream and the dream of my producer Anna Palenchuk. Uh, a long time already to make this movie uh, happen. Uh, we are lucky that we got the opportunity to work on the script with the uh, best experts on avant-garde art, experts on Malevich biography from uh, Ukraine. Um, one of them, Tatiana Filevska, creative director of the Ukrainian Institute in Kiev, uh, who 
who is already the author of a few books about Malevich and his times in uh, Kiev, and um, also the members of Malevich family who give us consultation on the story. And I think it's a very exciting uh, stuff because um, from one side, it's like a film Frida, if you saw this, those who know, because it has very strong political context. It tells about uh, this situation when the avant-garde artists strongly believed in the upcoming Soviet revolution and then got completely disappointed and, and became the victims of the Soviet regime that was born in 1920s. And Malevich, one of them. And uh, the second point for us, which is important, the whole world knows Malevich, but actually no one knows that he was born in Ukraine, that he spent his childhood in Ukrainian villages, that he spoke Ukrainian language, that uh, he witnessed uh, the tragedy of Holodomor, this horrible starvation when millions of people were killed by Stalin. And he was the one who dared to paint uh, the starving people in his works, even though he knew he can be arrested or even killed for this. So this is really exciting material and uh, I'm looking forward. We got already financing from our film fund. I hope that we'll be um, able to realize, uh, to make this project next year. We're still looking for co-producers abroad um, going to present this um, project next uh, week in the Tallinn and Baltic events. And um, I hope we find also interesting people. If someone from UK is uh, interested to work with us, you're welcome. Wonderful. I'm really thrilled to hear about that. Uh, one of our guests mentioned MUBI, which is a platform based here in the US that uh, shows many independent films. So the question was, did you have a chance to talk to them about potentially uh, showing the film uh, here in North America through that platform? Uh, no, I didn't have the chance. If uh, you could uh, send me a uh, contact, this would be great. Maybe through Alessia or Vitali. Um, we have a world sale. It's French company, The White. So I can forward it to them. Wonderful, because I think there will be certainly an audience uh, here in the United States and in Canada that members of the diaspora community and other people who care about Ukraine and want to learn more. I mean, I know that there definitely will be an appreciative audience for that. Um, uh, I guess it's more of a comment than a, than a question that came from Anna Reed and that uh, the, uh, a Malevich film would have to be with a lot of bright colors. So I guess it'll be in that sense, very different from the from this film. So how do you imagine it right now visually? Is it going to be like a lot of very bright, saturated colors in it? And my lady, it's just colors. Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to show actually all periods of his life also visually in the movie because mm -hmm. he came through realism, expressionism, cubism when time when he was admiring Picasso and was dreaming to meet him and ending with uh, suprematism. So I think it will be cool to show us all this um, emphasize all this also visually in the um, scenes and uh, I think the uh, good uh, art directing is extremely important for such movie uh, the whole color concept should should be properly worked out together with DOP and I think still realistic uh, style of shooting can be combined very good with uh, this bright uh, um, color concept like uh, good examples for this uh, Van Karvay is just like a classic for me who does very realistic films, but uh, with great color palette, um, but also some kind of uh, more um, film for the white audience uh, by um, the Joker. Joker is a great uh, DOP work, uh, very realistic, but very strong characters and also great colors of Joker. Uh you mentioned so, such different but all good things so i'm trying to imagine frida in the Witch for love <laughs> and joker sort of rolled up and what it being about malevich uh i am excited uh switching back to the current film and a serious question uh did you have uh, did you hear uh reactions from folks who are now living in the occupied territories to the film. Has anyone there been able to, 
to see the film? And if yes, uh, what did they share with you? No, so the people who are really now stocked there, um, and there were just very few, a few people. And also people who are like in between, who go there and here, they also gave uh, their feedback. So it's not, of course, it's uh, just like concrete people. It's not the whole impression. But uh, as I said already, that in, in my opinion, we managed to tell a realistic story, that the impressions are good, that the people, um, are moved uh, by the main characters, are moved by Marina uh, Sleet um, a lot. Also the character of her husband, played by Vasily Kucharsky, um, is a strong part and many people say that um, he shows exactly this kind of people you talked about before. The people who just don't care, who are like somewhere in between and who don't, uh, who just accept the reality as it is because it's more comfortable for them. So they don't want to go out of their comfort zone, even if the violence and war happens around them. And these people really exist. And that's what um, the people from the region said, but also, um, I must say that's why we also again call this movie The Forgotten because this was something I heard from all those people that we feel forgotten here uh, by the Ukrainian government. We feel uh, forgotten here by the Ukraine and as also the boy says in the film like no one needs us uh, there and they say that, uh, that, that we're like enemies that we betrayed them because we stayed here. Uh, so um, I try to speak uh, for these people in a way. Um, I see, thank you. Um, question uh, uh, that we have another question from Mrs. Kaczmarski and that is uh, something that relates to also I wanted to bring up and that is, I guess it's more of a journalistic uh, question that is whether there is any possibility in these occupied territories, in the so-called DNR and LNR for people to protest. I don't think personally there is much because these are very brutal and repressive regimes, but we have had some situational protests like graffiti art, for example. Yeah. And also we have in our young man, of course, he's being a bit of a guerrilla fighter. And I was thinking of this guerrilla group called the Ra Ravlike, the snails. I was wonder wondering if they were one of the inspirations for having this sort of guerrilla fighter role for him in the film. No, for this boy, there was a real story that happened in Luhansk with a school boy who put mm -hmm. the flag on the, on the building. And there were a few cases like this in uh, uh, different cities since the beginning of the conflict. Uh, so the, there is a kind of this partisan undercover uh, movement which really spread like Ravlik spread sometimes some papers, some um, uh, advertisement or uh, how, how to say it in English, materials around or make graffiti as you just said mm -hmm. or put the flags and it, it demands lots of courage uh, uh, because you can really get in, into big troubles. Um, Every moment, one of the one of the most uh, like the critic moments when you ask like what the people said who have been there. And uh, now I came to my mind. It was at the scene in the police department when the policeman analyzed on this woman. Uh, I was told that in in real the story would be much uh, worse that they will I don't know rape or kill her at the end. And I had to explain that. Um, for me, the author, it was not uh, my intention to show the violence as much as I can, but I, I think this um, uh, scene is uh, strong and violent, full of violence enough without show, showing it so implicit. But uh, this was kind of feedback, so uh, the people thought it could be even much worse. I guess one of the uh, next ones that I uh, wanted to ask is. Uh, given that I am here in the United States and there are several folks uh, among our audience who are also from the US, is uh, whether you have had uh, opportunities to engage with uh, not just a movie company, but you know, with festivals here and things of this kind. We are fortunate that we've had a breakthrough 
uh, with Irina Tsivaka at Sundance with her documentary film, the last festival before the quarantine shutdown. Uh, but I think this film definitely would find a responsive audience here in the US. So I hope uh, possibilities of that kind are being considered. Yes, I hope so too. I um, don't know the now this uh, how it, how it is at the moment. Uh, the last information is from my world sale, but I hope we come to USA, especially because I know that we have such a big diaspora there, and I would like to the people there to see it. Mm -hmm. Also, Canada uh, is a country Definitely. where I would like to show the film. And. Uh... I guess my next question is, I mean, you mentioned, we've talked already about Switzerland a little bit. We have seen a lot more in the co-production initiatives, the ones with the countries that are not the usual suspects, not, you know, larger countries with these traditions like Germany, but say Switzerland in your case, there was a Ukrainian Icelandic co-production recently and uh, things of that kind. Do you think there, is especially sort of a productive future future in pursuing such co-production projects outside the the sort of big countries that filmmakers think of first, but actually try to reach out to countries that have not had those kind of co-production opportunities with Ukraine before. I think there are two important steps that Ukraine now took to develop its co-production market. It's uh, first of all, Creative Europe participation in uh, Creative Europe mm -hmm. programs. Uh, we are still not allowed to be completely financed just to participate in educative programs uh, like Midpoint, but uh, we have to become now a member and uh, it's because the procedures are uh, going on and also Oire Marsh. Oire Marsh will give us the opportunity to do more and more co-productions. Already two new projects have got the financing uh, just a few months ago. We also start now the system of cash rebates. Um, I hope it will start to function also in the next months and this will involve more and more companies from Europe, uh, from big or small countries, whatever, because sometimes it's more easy to do a co-production with a small country. Uh, production companies like in Germany and France, uh, for instance, Italy, they have so many projects, so many um, directors from their own countries. Uh, so sometimes it takes like years to get financing from them. But if you take a small country like Iceland or Switzerland, uh, um, they're looking for projects because they don't have so many of uh, their own. Uh, so I think it's a good possibility. Uh, in Ukraine, many, uh, many uh, people in the film fund still don't understand why we have to develop minority co-productions. They say like the co-production should be also majority over uh, Ukraine, but minority co-productions are also very important. They give our filmmakers the opportunity to learn a lot, to learn from the experience of other countries, and also with smaller budgets to become a part of a big and professionally done uh, project. So I hope that also more uh, minority co-productions will be done um, in the next years. Thank you so much. We have some more questions from the audience. And um, we have a question from uh, uh, Robert Brinkley. Uh, Mr. Brinkley, if you could please ask your question now. Where's my question? Yes, please go ahead. Um, it's it's from me, from Mary. It's not from Robert. Okay. Uh, I don't have the text of my question in front of me anymore. I'm sorry. Uh, but what I wanted to ask was how the whole episode in the uh, prison, police station, detention, whatever you call it, was was how you decided as a team how to how to play this whole question when it started, and the policeman. Uh, proposed to Nina that she should sit there. And, uh, um, of course, you immediately think, what would I do in this situation? What is she going to do? Is she going to slap them? Is she going to scream? How is she going to react? And then, of course, she just turns to ice or stone. Um, who decided what she would do? Was that already, you, you were quite clear how it was going to go from the start? Did anybody suggest it should go another way. Can you talk us through how you how you played that? I thought it was very powerful. 
Thank you. Um, thanks for a question. Um, these scenes are, of course, normally not easy. Uh, I shoot it always with small teams, so I send all people who don't who can be not there, we send away. So we just leave the DOP cameraman, some guys who hold sound equipment and light and all other part of the team, 30, 40 people should just leave uh, behind the doors. Um, of course, we do rehearsal before. Um, I think it's important for such scenes to, how to say, to keep a sense of humor. <laughs> Actually, we were laughing also a lot with the actress. Uh, the boys were laughing less, <laughs> I must say. Uh, but uh, about her reaction, how she has to come through this, uh, I come uh, sometimes when I discussed this with actress, I come also from my own kind of reaction on stress situation, on fair situation. Some people start screaming. Uh, some people cannot say a word and freeze, so everyone has to find what is his own, what is more in his nature. And uh, she, um, she told me it's for her, it's more natural, she would do really nothing. And I think this can be much more strong as it now builds their kind of fight. And I think it's also freezing because it's quite clear for her as an um, adult woman, not an 18 years old girl, but an adult uh, woman, a teacher and so on, it's quite clear she won't escape from here. If she will uh, cry or, sh or shout, no one will hear her. So the best thing is just uh, to wait until it's over, let's say like this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we have a question from uh, Rachel Morley, uh, please. I was just wondering, please, Daria, could you talk a little bit about the films and or the filmmakers who've inspired your work on this film in particular, but maybe also more generally, whether in terms of the subject matter that you're making films about, but especially in terms of the aesthetics? Um, Vitaly, could you help me uh, shortly to translate? I didn't get the whole. Uh, так, а питання, які фільми, які режисери вас надихнули і ah, uh, uh, точки зору теми цього фільму і з точки зору естетики, в якій цей okay, фільм був зняти? What I was inspired by. Uh, okay. Yes, thanks for the question. You know, as uh, as I named already by Malevich, uh, lots of uh, very different examples. Um, I really have some. I cannot say that I am uh, have just one concrete taste in cinema, which I really follow, but maybe Lars of Trier's, uh, uh, Trier is one of my very fam uh, favorite uh, directors. Um, I also love Von Karavai, which has already uh, called a name before. Uh, we have Ukrainian German uh, film director Sergei Loznitsa, whose early works um, I also uh, liked a lot. I am a big fan of uh, Jacques Odiar, of um, his film Geschmack uh, von Rost und Knochen. I don't know how the taste of bones and um, I forgot this uh, title in um, English, but probably you know uh, the films of Jacques Odiar. And um, I like realistic um, uh, films. If we take Russia, it would be uh, Zvagintsev, uh, it's author cinema, but it's also this kind of uh, storytelling where you strongly believe in the characters and in the story itself. Uh, that's why this kind of uh, realistic light, uh, um, lots of improvisation with the actors. Um, and I follow the directors who work in this style and try um, to learn for myself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, uh, we have a question from Lydia Duhl, who asked me to read out the question. Dear Daria, thank you so much uh, for your amazing film. As someone who grew up in the Luhansk region, I cannot thank you enough for showing the reality to the world and to the Ukrainians themselves. Wishing you and your film every success. What is your assessment of the attitude of the mainland Ukrainians to Donbass at the moment? Do you think they want it back? And the second question, will the film come to Netflix? <laughs> About uh, thanks for a question and for uh, compliments. Um, Netflix, I don't know, we should ask uh, Netflix. I'm not sure. I think uh, we are not commercial enough for them. I'm afraid we're not, to com not too commercial for them. Um, as uh, for people um, who 
want to come back, who can come back. We already started to talk with Vitaly uh, about this. I personally uh, try to be optimistic, even though that many people in Ukraine are not. Unfortunately, when I come now to Kiev, when I speak with people there, every time I see more and more um, a kind of depression and uh, very... Um, pessimistic attitude that uh, we will uh, manage to get these territories back. But when I speak to people who are from there, they still have this hope. Um, I know lots of um, displaced people who moved to uh, Ukrainian part and who found themselves, who managed to uh, build a new life completely from zero, who managed to build some new business or find place to work, but also many people who feel completely, completely lost and uh, miss their home and know that their whole life was taken away from them. And for those people, I just can uh, really wish this one day this happens. Um, I strongly believe that Putin regime will, uh, won't exist uh, forever. All uh, dictatorships fall one day. And um, now we see what happens in uh, Belarus. Uh, we see this uh, very courageous women uh, who go on the streets, who fight for their ideals, for their dreams, for the freedom of their country. And we see that this uh, kind of uh, funny dictator president of Belarus, it's it just ridiculous. It's, it's like a, some stupid uh, comic, I don't know. And uh, somehow this can be. And... Uh, I don't know. Also with Trump, we had to wait quite long, but now we got rid from Trump. I hope one day we'll get rid from Putin.